Hi, everyone. Welcome to Stream and Hub Radio. I am Sage Stevens, the host of Shout Out with Sage. My guest today is a composer and filmmaker who recently scored the feature film Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose, starring Simon Pegg and Minnie Driver, directed by Adam Siegel. His solo songwriting career under the name Will Post has resulted in over 22 million streams and his song Wonderlust shot to number one after it was featured on Netflix's The Kissing Booth 2. His very first film as a writer director titled Entrainment was an official selection at FilmQuest this year. And I want to welcome to the show today, Bill Prokopow. Hey, Bill, how are you? I'm good, Sage. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks for being here. So how did the opportunity with Nandor happen for you? Let me see. How did the opportunity happen? Um, it was one of those, you just kind of got to know somebody. Um, <laughs> my roommate, Luca Malacrino, uh, who I've lived with for the past few years, um, has been an actor and producer in the LA area for a while. I'm fairly new to town. I've been here almost four years. Um, but last year he was talking to a producer friend of his over in the UK and uh, they mentioned they were working on this film and that they needed a composer. And so he set me up an intro with the producer, the producer Dom Burns, uh, who is now a great friend. And um, he sent me the script and set up a meeting with the director. And uh, that was my that was my in from there. So I guess it all went well for you then with all the meetings. It, it was it was pretty it was pretty beautiful, actually. So so I read the script um, the night before I had a meeting with Adam uh, and I just loved the script. And the next morning before the meeting, I was just kind of meditating in bed and kind of relaxing. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, music started to come to me based on what I had read. I just, I, I very much could see as I was reading the script, rather I could hear the music. To me, it felt like a very musical film. There were these long sequences, these long kind of montage sequences near the beginning that as I was reading, the music was just like kind of pouring through. And in that sense, I wasn't hearing anything yet, but I just knew that there was gonna be a lot of music. And then before the meeting I had with Adam, I just had this theme come to me, these four chords. Um, and so I went over and started playing it on the piano and very quickly I had this little kind of suite composed. Um, so my first meeting with Adam over Zoom, uh, we talked a little bit, a bit about the film uh, and what he was looking for. And then I said, hey, I have some music that I just wrote, would you like to hear it? And he said, yeah. And yeah, so I played this sure. little thing for him. Let me... um, and he was like, yeah, that's the theme right there. Uh, okay. And then it was off to the races. Does it usually happen um, like that for you where it's, you know, you meditate on something like, are you really intuitive with your music? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think the more that I do this work, the more that I realize the work on my end is getting myself into a place where I'm receiving. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's my job as human body bill to think <laughs> of anything. I think it's my job as my body to get into a, a relaxed state where I can feel excited and joyful. Um, and then that's when the creativity flows mm. from something that's higher than me. And then it's my job to stay out of the way and as much as possible, just translate that and channel that into something. Um, I find if ever I'm in a position where I think that with my brain, I'm trying to force something out, that's never how it comes out most gracefully and most beautifully. <laughs> it's, it's always when I step back as human brain bill and relax and go into my heart and usually don't think about the thing that I'm trying to do, I I'm allow I can allow it to come through and that's when it comes through and that's when it feels the most satisfying and the most good and the most connected with with everything that I'm looking for. Right. Did you have like care like when you read the script you had definite characters in mind and each one had a had a tone to it? Um for this one not necessarily. I mean 
as I was reading it, uh, it's it's really centered around Simon Pegg's character, Nandor Fodor. Right. Um, the title of the film is just the character's name, Nandor right. Fodor and the Talking Mongoose. Right. So it's, rather, it's, a, I, I, it's a mouthful I, to say, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I certainly had in my mind the character of a scientist and mm -hmm. what goes on in a scientist's brain um, and how the gears turn in a scientist's brain. Um, and I thought that mode was a really interesting mode from the theme of a talking mongoose, which I think is very antithetical to the intellectual scientist brain and way more the the feeling intuitive animal type spirit. Um, as a, as one of the characters says in the movie, Jeff's an earth spirit. Um, so at the beginning of like, like before you even get into the script, you have this great setup of heart verse brain of right. intellect versus intuition. Um, yes. And I knew that there would be room in the film to play around with those themes musically. With Nandor Fordor, it is based on a true story. And did you, did that influence you at all? Like, did you do any research about that? Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know, we were, uh, we were contacted by a relative of Nandor Fodor, I think a great grandson. <laughs> And everyone's coming us... knocking on the door now <laughs> <laughs> well he it was really interesting he sent us some of nandor fodor's original music um, oh, wow. that he had written much later so the film takes place in the 30s um and nandor fodor went on later in his life to also write music um, which actually has oh, a very wow. electronic feel to it and uses a lot of tape delay and a lot of electronic sounds. Um, mm -hmm. By the time I had received that music and heard some of that music, the score had already been written and the themes okay. were already done. Um, but it was interesting to know that Nandor wasn't just a scientist, but that he also was in the arts and was a musician. Mm -hmm. And so I it just, I enjoyed that connection. And I certainly, as I was going through the film, um, I felt like I was trying to tune into what Nandor Fodor <laughs> would want the music to be, right. to be honest. And yeah. and thinking of like, how can I do this man, the spirit justice um, for this film? So you were meditating to him in another universe, let's say. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I, I, I think he definitely kind of helped and, and, and came through. Yeah. When you're working with the director, how do you incorporate their vision into what you're feeling? Hmm. I mean, the director's vision is everything. Uh, the music is always in support of the director's vision. Um, it's the director who's in charge of the film. And, and if I love, love, love a cue um, and the director says no, then I have right. to change the cue because uh, it's not my film. Um, and so it's always a matter of putting forward the best ideas that I have and giving the best reasons for that, um, then presenting them to the director in the way that I think is most fitting of the idea. Um, and then and then going from there. Um, and sometimes if I really like an idea, I'll and the director doesn't, I'll maybe fight for it and stand yeah. up and see see what what middle ground we can come to. Um, but, but every relationship with a director is is different. And and even in the course of every project, even in the course of Nandor, um, I feel like we got more on the same page, Adam and I, as the film went on. So that by the mm -hmm. final times that we were meeting to discuss the music, he was saying something as I was already thinking it. And we were very much right. kind of on the same page. And we'd kind of just say a half sentence and kind of <laughs> nod and then be like, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're Whatever. like in a real relationship, you know, you're dating or something. Yeah, I mean, because because like right. you know, listening to nonverbal cues mm. that people are like when someone's listening to my music, be it a director or a friend or my girlfriend or or whatever, um, I'm always very aware of that person's energy as they're mm. listening to the music, and then of my energy as I'm listening to the music. So someone can say, "Oh, that was fantastic," but I know, but I can know if I'm sitting in the same room as someone that actually they weren't really feeling it and that I actually need to do more to bring out mm. something here or there. 
you you're very intuitive and like feel their energy that they're they weren't being exactly truthful with you on on whether they liked it or not i i just think it's critical as an artist and 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 i'm always trying to remind myself to do this is like when i'm presenting something to someone um mm -hmm. I have to be as egoless as possible, especially if I'm asking for feedback, especially if I'm asking right. for feedback. Um, I have to kick my ego aside as much as possible uh, and say like, okay, I need to let the music stand for itself. And is, is the music doing what I want it to do? Like if I want the music to give someone shivers at this point, is it giving you shivers? And if it's not, then I'm not doing my job right. Do you feel that people are somewhat hesitant to really give you their truthful opinion? Um, no, not really. I mean, well, I, I, I think it <laughs> depends I, who you're I asking. I don't think so. I think it okay. depends who you're asking and, and, and the context in which you're asking. Like, right. um, if, it, if it's a passing conversation, like after the film and you're just like meeting someone at a party, and they're like, oh, I love the music. It's like, cool, great. Like, I, I don't actually like, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. And like, it right. might not matter. Um, but if I'm like, if someone's like in my studio and I'm saying, hey, like, I want to share this with you, I'd love your thoughts. Um, I also generally try to set up an environment where it's like, hey, like, you can really tell me anything. Like, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, so please, like, I'd rather have an honest reaction than you trying to save something or, or right. save my feelings in some way. I read that you recently found out you had some music in Bridgerton, like for the trailer. How, mm -hmm. how do you have a manager? How, how did that happen for you? How does your music end sure. up somewhere where you go, oh, wow, my music's in there? Well, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, so so I work with a company called Pusher, which does uh, which is laser focused on music for trailers. And so they do okay. all kinds of giant movie trailers, video game trailers. Um, and that's just kind of a fact of the world. Uh, in the trailer music world that you don't know that you're going to get a placement until basically the day it comes out. So pretty much every single placement that I've had, uh, I find that I find out the day that it comes out, even if I've been working with Pusher and, and the trailer house to develop and fine tune a track. Um, oftentimes there are sometimes months that go by where I don't hear anything. And then all of a sudden one day I get an email that was like, Hey, your music is up online in this trailer. Like, go check it out. Oh. Um, so, so it's always it's you, you never like you never wake yeah up with an email. It's like, oh, great, this is this is cool. You also have a solo career under the name Will Post. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, so I always have my hands in a lot of different things at any one point, um, and a lot of kind of differing things because it helps keep me interested and. I find that each one kind of informs another. So I do the film composing. I have a solo music project. Uh, I also have a film that I wrote and directed and scored and edited. Uh, and then I also do all, all kinds of other stuff and they all kind of inform each other. Um, and so the Will Post project came out of, um, actually I got the inspiration more than a decade ago uh, when I was on tour with my band, I Fight Dragons, which is a band from <laughs> Chicago that I'm in. That's That's still around. We were signed to Atlantic back in the day. We did a bunch of tours. Um, and that, I just kind of got inspired from seeing some of the other acts that we were on tour with. We did uh, this big tour with 303 and Cobra Starship and Travi McCoy, um, right when Travi McCoy's billionaire song came out with Bruno Mars. Yeah. Um, and so it was really cool to be in that environment and see these guys playing these large clubs. Um, and I was very inspired by that. And that's kind of what initiated the Will Post project and saying like, hey, like, I want to try my hand at this too. Like, like, I've always been a piano player. I've always been a singer. I've always wrote songs. Um, and so then there was a journey through that and I released a, an EP and then I did a project where I was releasing a new cover every week. And then the next year I wrote and recorded a new song every week. And I did that for six months. And then I put out a full length album and then an EP after that, and then did a live show that was a solo show. Uh, that <laughs> You're was busy. All projection mapping. I mean, this is also over the course of a decade. Um, okay. But um, but yeah, and then, and then I've had some great placements with, with that as well. What is the piece of music that you're most proud of? Oh, wow. What a great question. Um, it, it, it changes a lot. Mm -hmm. 
depends on your mood or what's happening it, or it, it kind of depends on the mood but um Honestly, I think it's it's a song called um, Starseed Discovery that was used in the most recent uh, Bridgerton trailer. Um, and it's funny, I, I've, I've written, I've written, I, I've had two instrumental pieces of mine that were placed in Bridgerton trailers, two seasons mm -hmm. apart. And both of those pieces of music, as I was writing them, I very much envisioned the piece, the music would go to some kind of epic space fantasy <laughs> story yeah, yeah like okay. i was imagining a star trek or a star wars <laughs> right um, so i think it's a little different yeah yeah but 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 it's really interesting to me that like i watched mindset... yeah i watched that trailer i watched it yeah so i saw i heard the music and i was like okay mm -hmm. I, I can see both i mean it totally worked in the trailer so thank you yeah yeah and and and, and i like that piece because it's in five four which is an unusual time signature um most time signatures of things that you hear are in four four so that's four beats okay. measure that's one two three four one two three four um oh, oh, or I, or i write a lot of things in triplet which is one two three one two three one two three one isn't that like a waltz kind of like a waltz, waltz. Yeah. yeah yeah okay. um exactly <laughs> Uh, but this piece, Interstellar Discovery, I don't know how I was playing around with it, but it's in five. So it's dun, 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 kind of like the Mission Impossible theme. Okay. Uh, that's in yeah, yeah. Uh, five beats uh, in, in a measure. And so this Interstellar Discovery was was that. Um, and I just like how everything in that piece kind of worked out. I like the melody and the grandiosity of it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, you'll have to school me on the music stuff because it's, no, it's okay. I, I'm definitely not. I just, I just want to, I just want to give you, <laughs> but no, just, thank like, you. I love piece. it. Like I do, I do, I do like being educated because, yeah. um, I remember taking music in school and obviously I didn't stick with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with your film that you wrote and directed, how long did you work on that to, like from conception to the actual, you know, it's on a screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so I started writing entrainment in May of 2020, kind of on a whim. I, I, I watched this sci-fi time travel movie called Primer by mm -hmm. Shane Carruth. And I watched that with my friend, my friends, uh, Luca and Jackson. And afterwards mm -hmm. we, we were freaking out about it and couldn't <laughs> stop talking about it. And then that night I went in my bedroom and just like started typing away. And that's where I kind of got the initial inspiration. Um, and then do I kind of worked on it. Do you always, like, did you write before that or? Um, not really. Uh, okay. It just kind of, it just kind of came to me. I was still new to LA. Uh, the pandemic had just begun. I was just, I was just feeling the energy mm -hmm. um, and just feeling very inspired um, from not only Primer, but a movie called Coherence and some other recent sci-fi movies that I had seen that had uh, very to me really cool concepts with very low budget uh, right. but still really worked um, and so that was just in my head and so um so then it took a, a few years to develop i mean I, I worked on that script off and on for about a year and a half and then uh the, the last year and a half of that was a more concerted effort um but i wanted to make a grounded sci-fi film um with just a few characters and i wanted the concept to be very strong and so you wouldn't need a whole bunch of special effects right so there's kind of keep it simple weird... keep it simple right keep it simple in terms of effects i think in the story i did not keep it simple um <laughs> because there's there's a quant there's weird quantum realm liminal okay. things in it there's um kind of multiple uh multiple universe type of things right. happening in it um but at the core of it it's based on a romantic relationship mm -hmm. and uh, kind of the central question of that is um what would you do for love how far would you go for love mm -hmm. and specifically in the context of of the characters that might not view death in the same way and not might not view reality in the same way how does that contribute to their perspectives on what they would do for love and how far they would go okay did you have a problem writing like i don't know like i know you're talented but like going from music writing to screenwriting did you have any type of a learning curve and when you asked for feedback 
did, like, did you submit it to any competitions or anything, or you just wrote and said, I'm going to do this? Sure. Well, I've been, I've been very lucky to have some amazing friends here in LA, Luca, Alex, um, Cynthia, um, many others who, who I've met, who are fantastic writers and producers and actors, um, who I've been able to give the script to and say like, Hey, like, shoot this down. Like, right. <laughs> tell me everything that doesn't make sense. Like, tell me where this breaks apart. Tell me where this doesn't work. Cause I really want it to work. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it makes sense to me, but this is my first time. So like, do your worst with this, just like right. character shreds. Um, and they were all very kind with it. Um, <laughs> but sir, but certainly like, like, like there's definitely a learning curve. Um, but one of the things that helped was having music in my head as I wrote it. Mm. Um, so there was that music was going to be one wrote. of my questions. Okay, you stole my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. I mean, kind of early on in the process, <laughs> I was writing music for the film as I was writing the script, right. and that really helped to tune into the vibe and the emotion of what I wanted. So if I was if I was having trouble conceptualizing a scene or or conceptualizing a direction or a tone. I would just put on the music that I that I wrote, or just go over to the piano and, and play some stuff, and mm -hmm. and sometimes inspiration would come through there. Um, right. And I would also say with the writing, I, I was also using it to test kind of this this theory of creativity. Where mm -hmm. again, I don't think this is creative. I think this is a receiver, and I think the creativity okay. is out there. Um, so I was testing that with the writing, and I was like, okay, well, like. If I put myself in a position where I just like tell myself I am a writer and I flow this and, and do the same thing I do with music, where I just get into a state where I feel good, relaxed, where things are flowing, where it's easeful, um, and where I have the mindset of writing, then I found that it could flow. And and every time that I wasn't in that mindset and trying to force stuff, it would it would feel painful. <laughs> So do you meditate, I'm sorry, <clears throat> do you meditate every morning or like, like, how do you approach your, your creativity? Um, I absolutely meditate every morning. Absolutely. Absolutely. Meditate every night. I meditate throughout the day as well. I take naps when I can. That's <laughs> a great source of creativity. If it worked for Albert Einstein, who was a big <laughs> fan of midday naps, um, okay. I, think, It'll I, work. I think it can work for us. So, so yeah, I mean, I mean that, that to me is a big part of my process is, is like, because not only does the meditation get me into a neutral or excited state, but it also allows any baggage that I'm holding, any, any things I don't want to continue going about my day with, that's an opportunity to let that go. And the more I've been finding that I can let that stuff go, the more I'm, I'm clear to be able to get stuff through. Right. So like if you're angry or you've had a bad day, you really need to get rid of that before you you start anything. For me. Yeah. 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 Okay. In, ter in terms of composing, what inspires you? That's a great question. Um, sometimes it's just sitting down at the piano writing. Um, sometimes it's a piece of music. Um, Sometimes it's a movie. Sometimes it's a it's an idea. Like, I I think inspiration is all around. To to be very cliche about it, <laughs> um, but but I truly do think it's all around. And I think the universe is is speaking to everyone at every moment. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just kind of a matter of when do you want to tune into that, and when and when do you need to do the laundry or do taxes. <laughs> Um, and can you tune into those things when you're vacuuming? I love to vacuum, which uh, <laughs> my, my partner makes fun of me for, um, even though it keeps the house nice and clean. But I, I love to vacuum because like even that's a very meditative thing where, yes. you know, I, I know it'll take five minutes. You know, I get to press like the gun thing. I walk around. Right. I don't have to think about anything else. And like even that can be inspiring because something can come through there. Right. You're doing like uh, sort of like mundane thing I, i've read different books and a lot of writers like screenwriters they always say like they're they're writing like when they're driving the car they're taking a shower or they're washing dishes like a lot of like really big ideas come to them when they're doing something else because then 
you're sort of out of your way. And I think it, you know, all your thoughts are in your subconscious and then, yeah, it's, yeah you're giving yeah. it a place to come out. Yeah. And um, like a lot of scientists say that that's in the kind of the beta brain wave mm -hmm. state um, right. where you're kind of like half focused on something. So the brain, so like, to me, what that means is like the brain has enough to do where the brain isn't overthinking. Like mm -hmm. if you're just kind of sitting and, and not doing too much and you don't have any animals that are trying to attack you and you're not <laughs> hungry, the brain can really go into overdrive and start yeah. to worry and start to get anxious and start yeah. to overthink. But if right. you give the brain like just enough to do to like have it be occupied and then kind of allow it to get out of the way and uh, and get into that beta state, um, uh, though a lot of scientists say that's not necessarily the ideal state of creativity. There, there's the, the theta, there's delta, alpha, gamma. Right. You can be creative in all those states, but but that's just maybe one way to do it. Um, so, in, so inspiration comes from all around, and and sometimes it comes from dreams. There, there was a scene in Nandor Fodor uh, mm -hmm. where I literally, I was just so in it writing the music at the time, I had a dream where I was composing the music. Actually, I had a dream where someone else was composing the music. And I pushed them aside from the piano and started to play something on the piano. And soon after that, I woke up and walked right over the piano at 4 a.m., turned on my recording device and started playing a piece. And that ended up right in the film, in, in this moment where a character has this very emotional breakdown and sees the mongoose and it speaks to him in this poem uh, and it allows him to overcome the grief of his uh, wife's passing. Mm -hmm. um, and that musical moment literally came to me in a dream. I heard it in a dream, I played in the piano and wow. it went in the movie. That's amazing. That's always like good to hear. I meditate, I'm not quite at your level. So I guess there's 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 room for improvement and hope for me yet. <laughs> there's, it's, it's always just a practice. You know, there, there's right. no goal in it. It's always just a practice. With, um, with the film, it deals a lot with skepticism and people who don't believe in certain things and people that do believe in certain things. Do you believe that there was actually a talking mongoose? Hmm. <laughs> so I won't answer that question directly, <laughs> okay. but I'll I'll answer it in terms of how I approached the movie. Okay. Because what I because what I wanted to do with the music. I wanted the music to be a believer in the mongoose yeah. because without giving too much away in the film. Yeah, no spoilers. Yeah, <laughs> at, at, at least early on in the film, most people when they talk about the mongoose and most people in the town report that they never actually see the mongoose. Mm -hmm. They just hear the mongoose and they know that it's there. And I instantly saw the correlation between that and music. You never see music unless someone's right. playing it. So I guess sometimes you do see music, but in the film, there were no, there's no on-camera instrumental. So, but you mm -hmm. always hear the music, you never see it. You feel it, but you never see it. And I thought in, I thought early on, what a great metaphor for Jeff, mm -hmm. uh, the mongoose. Uh, and so what I wanted to do with the music was I wanted the music to believe in Jeff so that no matter what the characters were doing and how the, they were going through their arc of the story, the music was always kind of subtly pulling at them to believe, just like Jeff is always kind of pulling at them to believe. It was it was very um, interesting to see in the movie how you know people with science and skepticism versus uh, you know people that believe. But I also think there's that sort of like a small town aspect sometimes as well, like. Mm. I think it it brings everyone together. And you're originally from Chicago, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. So how was yeah, that? Suburbs. Right. So how was that move to LA? And did you come here specifically to, you know, pursue a, your music career? I did. Yeah, I, I, I came here very much to pursue film and film scoring and everything that that would lead to. Um, I love Chicago so much. I was born and raised in the suburbs there. Um, I went to college downstate University of Illinois. I spent a bunch of time in Chicago in the music scene, playing in bands, doing gigging, all kinds of stuff. Um, and it was really the film industry that 
um, really pulled me out here. And I, I always knew that I wanted to do that. And it was more just a, always a matter of time and when uh, rather than if. Okay. What were some of the hurdles you faced when you first arrived in LA? Hmm. Um, well, the pandemic. <laughs> I, I got here. I got here in November of 2019. I got here in November of 2019. So I, I had just a little bit of time to uh, to 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 get settled. Um, I stayed with a friend for a while, um, amazing man named Sheldon Stein. Um, I stayed with him in his guest room, looked after his dogs for a bit. Um, and that allowed me to kind of get my feet wet and see the scene. And I had stayed there a few times before, um, kind of slowly meeting people, getting the lay of the land. Um, but I was lucky to be able to have not only that place right when I moved, but also have some gigging work, um, okay. playing the piano and singing at Mastro's restaurants, a steakhouse. Oh, I've been there many times. And, so oh, really, course, I probably course, saw on. you. Right on, yeah. I just so don't I, recognize I, you. Like, oh, that, that's you. That's where I knew you from. Right on. A couple of my other yeah, friends have done, have worked at Mastro's, so that's funny. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah small world. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'd done that for four years in Chicago. I played every Thursday, Friday, Saturday night at the Mastro's in Chicago. And then when I moved out here to LA, I was able to keep doing that gig in, in all of those different places here. So I was very fortunate to have a, a living situation, to have those gigs and to already be working on trailer stuff when I came out here. So, um, so even then when the pandemic hit a few months later, which, uh, you know, shut all of the live performing down, which is what I was really doing at the time. Um, I was in a position where I was, I was able to get over that hurdle, um, intact. Yeah. yeah, yeah. With someone who is, musical and they they want to pursue a path similar to yours what would your advice be um my advice is that there there is no one path uh <laughs> there 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 is my path and then there is your path and then there's right. someone else's path and then another and then another person's path mm -hmm. um and that really nobody has the answers apart from you mm -hmm. um you can talk to all the people that you want and they will tell you this is how it's done right this is the way to do it these are the rules and for them that's true uh but there are no hard and fast rules for anything almost anything in this world i think <laughs> there are always ways around everything that anybody will tell you is the way to do it and for me i've always found that getting in touch with what you really want and what really excites you is always the path to take. Um, even if that excitement feels like it's leading you off course from what your brain might think, I think always that the heart knows the direction that your higher self kind of wants you to take and that by listening and getting quiet in your mind and listening to the intuition of your body, that's the thing that will actually lead you. And the more and more that I've found that I trust that, the more and more that I find that that leads to really interesting and fun and amazing <laughs> and profitable and beautiful experiences. Um, but but you got to learn to trust that and trust yourself. Because right. um, all, all of the second guessing that you do and saying, well, this person said it had to be done this way. And this person who really knows what they're talking about told me I had to do it this way. Um, that's all true for, for them. Right. Um, and this is all true for me. So also take all of this with a grain of salt because right. everyone's. No, I, totally, I, I agree with you because people always ask me as well. It's like, well, you know, I want to be a writer. I want to be an actor, you know, what, whatever it may be. And it's like, you know, I can give you information, but I, I don't mm. really like giving you like advice. Like I'll just give you sort of like some information, but it's exactly like you said, you have to find your own way and everyone's journey is different. So I, I totally 100% agree with you. Is there anyone in your career that really gave you some sage advice, like anything that really resonated with you? I always got to give it up to my teachers. I had some really amazing music and entertaining actor, acting teachers growing up. My, 
my elementary school music teacher, Bill Vanninen, was such, such a huge influence in my early life. Um, his name was also Bill. He <laughs> also played the piano by ear. He also wrote songs. Um, we also have a shared Finnish background. Um, mm. But he convinced my parents to get me my very first keyboard. Uh, okay. And he was one of my cheerleaders like really early on. And I think my life would have honestly turned out different if I hadn't had that support from when I was, you know, kindergarten through fifth grade. He was always there. I was always wanting to write music and play it for the class. Um, <laughs> and he was always just so supportive. Um, and then from then on, middle school, high school, college, I also had some amazing teachers. Mrs. Mo, um, Patrick Murphy, Dribben, uh, Dr. Coleman, um, Mr. Davidson, all like, I got to give it up to my teachers. Like, right. Yeah. Do you think in it's addition a, to my mom and dad? Of course. Right, of course. Of course. Do you think having that type of support is really important for a creative person? I think it can be. Right. Again, I, you know, I think it really depends on the person because I think there are other people that might be in a vacuum of that stuff and are able to thrive and, and pick out a different path for themselves. Um, <laughs> And I'm certainly an advocate of that kind of education and really good arts education for everyone, um, just to help round out people and make them whole humans. Um, so I do think it's important. Um, yeah. Even if but, even if you're not good at it. <laughs> even if you're not good at it, yeah, because and, and it, it doesn't matter because the, the, the skills that you can learn from practicing an instrument, from practicing an, an artistic craft, I think right. translate to so much. Yeah, well, just to, yeah, to be knowledgeable about it, even though you might not be good at it. So as I said, I did music, yeah. but I'm not good at music. <laughs> That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you listen to music and appreciate it. I do, music. I love and music. Like, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm sure like you have a very personal connection with, with some definitely, of stuff. Like, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Sing yeah. badly in the shower to it all the time. No. That's great. <laughs> okay, we digress. How do you mm. decide what to say yes to when an opportunity is presented to you or a project comes through how do you decide what to say yes to um i think that comes to intuition um <laughs> it, it it all kind of continues to circle back around to like getting my brain out of the way and listening to my body and, and my heart and my gut um whether it's a musical project or a film project or a life project or a business project or, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, I'm always trying to tune into, okay, like if, is, if, if I'm getting excited about it, am I getting excited because it's something in, in my body? Cause it's my gut getting excited. Is it my brain getting excited? Is it a voice inside of me? That's, um, a parent or a teacher or somebody else that's getting, or, or a friend that, like is it actually my excitement first of all or is it someone else's excitement and then if it's my excitement uh why am i getting excited about it is it because it feels holistic and full and complete or is it about because it it like does it feel like an excitement on a certain layer of my body or a certain area of my body um so i try to hone in on that um and, and that's what I find I really try to tune in to be guided with, with all of this stuff. If there is a project that you said no to in the past, do you ever look back and sometimes wonder, oh, maybe I made the wrong decision? Is there anything that sort of slipped through that you later look back on? Um, I can do that sometimes, but I think to me that's the work of the brain over analyzing mm. um, and getting into that uh, roundabout kind of anxiety mode. And <laughs> I mean, certainly there are things and opportunities that I've had that didn't work out. I've had tons of rejection over my life, um, right. tons of no's and things. Um, I auditioned, you know, for American Idol five times, <laughs> you know, never really got on the show. I made it round farther every time, but like those rejections were always like, I always thought that I was going to get it, go all the way and it like never worked out. Um, so I've, I've like, I've, I know I'm kind of painting a rosy picture of this, but I've <laughs> certainly had lots and lots of rejection right. over in my life. And at times certainly I've wondered like, okay, like what if that had happened or what if this right. had gone through? Um, but then 
I, I find that it's not all that helpful. Mm -hmm. um, right. Well, to look back, you should be, you know, they say you should be living in the now, not the future and not the past. But, you know, mm -hmm. just sometimes you do learn from, you know, past experiences. Like I know with myself, there's things that I said no to. Usually I'm pretty solid on my nose, but there are have been a few things where I'm like, mm, maybe I was yeah. a little bit too quick on that. Or yeah. I should have given them more of an opportunity or stuck around a little longer to see actually where it was good to go. So. Yeah. And, 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 and I do think you learn a lot through that because and 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 to me what i what i focus on is okay like how do i feel afterwards like mm -hmm. if i do say no to something and i realize maybe i should have like i'm going to pay more attention to that feeling and and mm -hmm. and i'll kind of realize in that process it's like okay well, like it, actually like if i'm honest with myself mm -hmm. there was something in there that i wasn't reading right or i wasn't paying attention to but like i had some foreshadowing that maybe i should have <laughs> And so in the future, I'm going to listen to that more. And I don't as much pay attention to what the actual thing was or what mm -hmm. the rejection was, but I try to pay attention to that feeling of like, okay, what was that feeling like where I didn't listen to my higher wisdom? And when I used my brain and outthought myself instead of listening to my body and okay, I'm going to remember what that feeling feels like right. and then try to not do it again. We're, we'll try. We'll try not to do. We'll try. Again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just try. That's, that's all you can do. Sometimes. Well, the opportunity that came along with Nandor that sort of seems like it was a networking, uh, not necessarily networking outright, but through your contacts. How important is networking to you? And so far, what's happened? I mean, it's, it's, it's everything. Like mm -hmm. I, I would not be doing the stuff that I'm doing now if I weren't in LA here, if I didn't have an amazing group of, of friends um, that are working on things and, and supportive and, and we're all supporting each other and working with each other in things. Um, because I, I, and to me, the, this question gets more at relationships and that, I don't want to just be making stuff by myself and I don't want to be making stuff with people that I don't like. Um, <laughs> cause, because the process of making this stuff, it's long, me, it, it, it's long <laughs> and it's just as important as the final thing. You can't have a happy ending without a happy journey and mm -hmm. to have a happy journey, you need to be around the people that light you up and get you excited and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that was actually a big turning point in my life. And when I really decided to move to LA was when I did a solo show with my Will Post project. It was an hour yeah. long. It was me playing the piano and singing. I had this giant projection. I had 30 screens of projection oh, wow. app behind me. Um, I orchestrated all of the video. I edited, I remixed, I produced it. It was all synced up. And right before I went on and did the show, I was kind of asking myself, I was like, what have I done here? I was like, this is so me, like focused on me and totally right. dependent on me. And there, there absolutely was collaboration in the writing of the music. My right, my musical writing partner, Andrew mm -hmm. Lothian was amazing. Um, the, the mixer, Matt Hennessy was amazing. So I had amazing people involved in the project, right. but so much of it was just me. And, and I didn't like that anymore. <laughs> I just got to this point where I was like, no, like well, I want to be lot collaborating of with people. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a lot of pressure and, and, and I just want to be working with people. So like in terms of like, like bringing it back to networking, to me, the networking is finding people that you want to work with, um, and that you have a similar shared vision. Um, and, and sometimes you got to meet a lot of people to, to, to find those people that you really connect with. Yeah, definitely. You have to find those people, your your tribe or people that at least want to see you grow and, and go on to bigger and better things. Yeah. How do we find you online? Uh, well, you can go to Google and type my <laughs> name. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm on Instagram uh, at uh, Prokopo, my last name, P-R-O-K-O-P-O-W, all long O's there. Um, Twitter slash X broke a bow, but I don't use that. I mean, Instagram is the main way. Instagram. And then I have all, all, that's where I put all my main updates and my, and my website, brokeabow.com is linked to on there. 
Um, so that that's the main thing. Everything will come through there. And you can find out more about my short film Entrainment um, and all the other fun stuff that's happening. Do you have anything new coming up? What are you working on? Uh, yeah, so I'm working on the feature version of Entrainment. Mm -hmm. I want to, basically, that's a proof of concept sci-fi thriller um, that I want to make into a feature. Right. So I'm working on expanding that story. Uh, my girlfriend and partner, Cynthia Oka, is also a writer and an amazing poet and screenwriter. And we're teaming up on some feature story ideas as well. Um, so we have a bunch of that in the works. Um, my roommates and friends, uh, Luca and Alex, they have two features coming up next year that they're doing, Dominus, and um, uh, I'm blanking on another name, but it's a Welsh <laughs> film, and so I'll be scoring both of those. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm just continuing to work on my music and trailer stuff and, and uh, continuing to meditate. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for sharing your spiritual awareness with us today. Oh. <laughs> and and good luck with your projects coming up. And for the rest thank of you, you, thank you. And for the rest of you, join us next Wednesday and see you then. So bye, everyone. Thank you so much, bye. Bill, for being here today. Thank thanks. you, Satan. Okay. Let me see how I get us off of here. <laughs> okay.